My name is Daphne Holt. I'm the chair of CLCI and I will chair this session today. Before we begin, just a little bit of housekeeping to do. If we have internet issues, please bear with us. Um, my connection is particularly unstable. At the bottom of your screen, you will see the chat function, which you can use to communicate with panelists and delegates, as well as the Q&A feature. And we will be collecting questions for the panelists. So do submit your questions and we will put as many as we can to our panelists. You're all invited to post comments on Twitter using the hashtag hitting new heights and at ILC UK. And I'm sure you will all know that if you get disconnected from the webinar, do use the same connection from the confirmation email to join back in. I'm really delighted today to be able to introduce you to an expert panel of speakers. Uh, we have MEP Cyrus Engero, Francois Ouye, European Organization for Rare Diseases, Mariana Vota, Active Citizenship Network, Sibelia Khaleesi, Vaccines Europe, Susanna Palkinen, European Federation of Allergy, uh, of Allergy and Airways Diseases Patient Associations. And last but not least, Patrick Swain, um, Research and Projects Officer at ILC and Coordinator for the Alliance between CLCI and ILC. So without waiting any longer, I'm pleased to invite Patrick to present the report. Patrick joined ILC in August 2020, and his role involves producing research and policy ideas with a particular focus on vaccination and immunization. Since November 2021, he's worked on secondment with CLCI as our co coordinator or the coordinator between the two organizations. Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daphne, for that introduction, um, and thank you to everyone who is joining today. I'm just going to start by discussing ILC and who we are, um, in case this is anyone's first time on an ILC webinar. Um, so the International Longevity Centre UK, or ILC, is the UK specialist think tank on the impact of longevity on society and what happens next. Um, this is our 25th year, and so we've been going since 1997. And as such, we are one of the founding members of the Global Alliance, which is an international network on longevity with 16 members across the world. And as Daphne mentioned, since November last year, I've been working as the coordinator for CLCI and ILC. Um, and CLCI, or the Coalition for Life Course Immunization, is a network of European individuals and associations representing public health, patients, academics, and health professionals. Um, we know that Immunisation is not just for children, and we are committed to preventing infectious diseases over the life course by highlighting the benefits of immunisation to our peers and to policymakers. So today I'm going to be discussing our new report, which is called Hitting New Heights, um, and I'm going to start presenting now. So just first a bit of background about our report. Um, so we, first of all, we looked at people with uh, chronic conditions and routine vaccine, uh, routine vaccination across Europe. So that's going to be my first part. Then I'm going to go on to the, the barriers that we found uh, through our conversations with experts. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some of the recommendations that we would like to see at a national European and an EU level. Um, so first of all, in terms of our research, we started this project mainly back in October last year, where we had a lunch with experts from across Europe, including policymakers, uh, patient charities and health experts. Um, I then also reviewed the data and the literature on vaccination in people with chronic conditions across Europe. And then we finally collated all of these ideas and figures, quotes and recommendations in a final report, which I'm going to present to you now. So a bit of background. Uh, how does Europe fare when it comes to uh, chronic disease patients uh, and routine vaccination? Well, as you can see on the screen here, around a quarter of adults, those aged between 15 to 64, across Europe have uh, two or more chronic conditions. Um, and when you break this down, we can see that the main people, or the main chronic conditions are those for, uh, not specifically just to the EU, sorry, but across Europe, more broadly as well, the uh, WHO Europe region. Um, they, the breakdown looks at uh, diseases such as diabetes, chronic kidney disease, asthma, chronic liver disease, COPD, chronic heart disease, uh, cancer, and HIV AIDS. Uh, as you can see, millions of people live with these conditions across Europe. 
Uh, and given that, uh, millions of people have recommended routine vaccinations, uh, specifically those for things like influenza or flu um, and pneumococcal disease. So routine vaccinations are recommended for a number of people with chronic kidney, liver, respiratory diseases, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, HIV, as such. Um, and the target for this is 75%. Uh, however, this target has not been met since it was set in 2010. Um, and it is around 45%. So uptake for routine vaccination for flu in people with chronic conditions was around 45% in 2018. Uh, even lower still was pneumococcal vaccine uptake. Uh, whilst the data is a bit dated on this, uh, coverage ranges between 20 and 30%. So as we can see, there are possibly a number of barriers to routine vaccination in people with underlying health conditions across Europe. Um, and through our discussions with the stakeholders at that lunch in Brussels, uh, we came up with four barriers, um, which we, we would associate with routine vaccination or low routine vaccination, shall I say, in people with chronic conditions across Europe. Uh, these included communication issues, a lack of political, social and economic cohesion, structural barriers and personal reluctance. So the first of these is communication issues. Uh, and communication barriers can be broken down into a further three areas. So that is a lack of tailored communication, misinformation or fake news, and discouragement by some healthcare professionals. So the quotes on screen I'm just going to show you now are from those discussions we've had with the experts, um, which are all in the final report. And the first one here is about uh, a lack of tailored information. So essentially what we found is there is a lack of uh, vaccine information that is tailored to specific conditions for specific people across Europe. And whilst people are recommended vaccinations, it is not necessarily communicated effectively to them. So as you can see on this quote on screen here, it's talking about that up until the pandemic, there has been a lack of robust evidence-based information tailored for chronic disease patients. Uh, misinformation is also something that we, we found during our discussions. And whilst misinformation affects all people, uh, it has the potential to really have an impact on people with chronic conditions. Um, this has become a, 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 a real issue during the pandemic, of course, as we see in the news every day of anti-vax uh, messages and sentiment that can be felt right across Europe. And finally as well, although this was also seen as a structural barrier in the report, uh, discouragement from healthcare professionals is something seen to me, I think as well, as a big communication barrier. So we spoke to one participant during the lunch who highlighted, highlighted that, especially with the COVID-19 vaccination, in some patients, doctors and nurses are discouraging the, the vaccination and, and saying to people not to get it, uh, which could be a real potential barrier for some people. Secondly, in our barriers that we came up with uh, was a lack of cohesion. And what do we mean by this? Well, we see that during our discussions, it was highlighted there are cultural disparities, gaps in preventative healthcare expenditure, and a lack of collective data or data sharing across Europe. That has a real impact on the, the ability for Europe to uh, increase and sustain routine vaccination uptake. So cultural disparities, uh, we can see that in some parts of Europe, um, there might be uh, more disparities when it comes to routine vaccination due to culture or uh, people's beliefs. So um, this is something potentially seen more in Eastern European countries um, with, with people historically challenging authority, authoritative figures. Um, and that permeates today with some people feeling more resentment to figures of authority. And there's a lack of trust between themselves and the people who are, are recommending vaccination or, or prescribing them. Furthermore, we're seeing uh, gaps in healthcare expenditure across Europe, which could really hinder vaccination uptake. Um, so, you know, less than 0.5% of European health budgets are dedicated to immunisation. Um, again, going back to Eastern and Western Europe, we can see some real disparities between uh, low immunisation, especially with COVID-19, uh, and with expenditure on immunisation and prevention. So the map on screen here is from the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control uh, and gives an idea of uh, just towards the end of January, COVID-19 vaccination, not specifically in chronic condition patients, but in European adults. So those over the age of 18. Uh, and as you can see on screen here, whilst countries in Western Europe have spent more on immunisation, uh, some countries in use in Europe have smaller healthcare budgets or have spent less on immunisation. And there is a slight correlation here between lower vaccine uptake for COVID-19 
um, and, and our healthcare budgets. And finally, when it comes to uh, this, these barriers uh, to, to, do, to do with uh, disparities, a lack of collected data or data sharing uh, is seen as, an, as another thing that could really have an impact on kind of uptaking chronic condition patients. Um, without a lack of data or knowing um, how many people have been vaccinated, uh, especially for diseases such as pneumococcal disease, uh, we really can't really start to make the case for increasing routine vaccination. Um, thirdly, we came across structural barriers during our discussions. So these can be broken down into things such as inaccessibility, either physically or geographically, uh, the cost of vaccination, which is can be um, burdened on some people with chronic diseases in Europe. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned then, actually, geography. So inaccessibility. So some, some stakeholders suggested that appointments can be inflexible and that vaccination isn't always easily made a part of some people's health regimes. So somebody might have a chronic condition and they might take medication, but vaccination isn't always made accessible or um, aware to those people or made a part of their health regime. Uh, cost as well, as you can see on the screen here, we have a, a nice quote from someone who says that, you know, not everyone is able to afford vaccination. And what do we mean by that? Well, as you can see on the pie chart here, um, from previous flu seasons, about 10% of EU or EEA countries charge chronic condition patients um, for the privilege of having a flu vaccine. Um, so whilst this is quite a small percentage in terms of how many countries, um, it is still a barrier to some people. And finally, as well, geography um, could potentially be a barrier for some people. Um, so as you can see, the Eurostat data on screen here, self-reported flu vaccination amongst people aged 15 to 64. Um, and whilst, uh, yes, proportionally more people would be living in cities and therefore reporting, it also goes to show that more people will have access or greater access to facilities such as pharmacies or healthcare centres in cities, whereas in rural areas, you might not have such easy access to those facilities. And finally, the last barrier we kind of came across during our discussions was a personal reluctance. So um, these can be broken down into complacency, efficacy concerns uh, or concerns with the vaccination uh, and feelings of mistrust. So complacency was a quite a, a big thing that came up in our discussions. And that's one of the three C's as well towards vaccination as well, for those not familiar. So sometimes, despite people having one or more chronic conditions, they might not see themselves at big enough risk of the, of the disease in question, say flu, and therefore will not decide to go and get vaccinated against that disease. Um, and this is, can be a real issue, given that actually the, the mortality rate for people with chronic conditions uh, against flu is much higher. Uh, secondly, we kind of came across efficacy, sorry, excuse me, efficacy concerns. Um, so some people might have concerns for how vaccines work and their side effects. This is especially true in light of COVID-19. Um, some people have raised their doubts about the, the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccination. And sometimes we don't really talk about the low risk of them. And actually that might be one of the reasons why people are concerned with vaccination. And finally, feelings of mistrust. Um, you know, whilst anti-vax sentiment is not um, confined to those with chronic conditions, um, they, they certainly might be felt by some people with underlying health conditions, and this can have a real negative impact. Um, with fake news and scepticism rising because of COVID-19, it's important that people with chronic conditions feel that they are able to make informed choices uh, and can trust the sources that they know. So given these barriers, uh, what do we believe? What are our recommendations? Um, so we came up with a, a set of recommendations, um, which are in the final report. Uh, and these include uh, recommending uh, that vaccine information must be improved. Secondly, that local engagement is used to encourage more uptake. And thirdly, that barriers access must be removed in order to improve vaccination uptake rates. So firstly here on the screen that we can see, um, it, you know, about improving information. Uh, we believe that at a European national level, governments should work with health organisations uh, and patient charities, sorry, European governments and health organisations should work with national patient charities uh, and local groups to produce tailored information for people with chronic conditions when it comes to vaccination. And at a, at a broader level, we think the ECDC should require member states to provide uptake figures for flu and pneumococcal vaccination among people with chronic conditions. Uh, at 
when it comes to our second recommendation on local engagement, we think that local organisations, citizens groups and patient charities should disseminate that information and run peer-to-peer -peer support networks on vaccination uh, to try and increase engagement on the topic. And secondly, we think that at an EU level, the European Parliament should establish a subcommittee on routine vaccination uptake uh, in Europeans with chronic conditions uh, and use this to really engage with constituents uh, and citizens across the bloc. And finally, what do we mean when we suggest removing barriers? Well, I mentioned uh, a moment ago that, that you know, there's 10% of European countries that incur costs uh, for people with chronic conditions. Those should be removed. Uh, and European national governments should consider making um, routine vaccination for people with chronic conditions something a part of a national health service, not something that could be passed on to the person with the condition. Uh, and secondly, at an EU level, we think that European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control should establish a common vaccination schedule across all member states, as well as a universal definition of what is a chronic condition that covers a range of underlying health conditions just to remove any doubts or any barriers about what, uh, what constitutes vaccination for people with chronic conditions across the EU. So that brings my presentation to a close, but as always, IOC and the CLCO, we welcome any further thoughts and ideas. So if you want to get in touch or want to get involved or, or arrange a meeting or anything like that, please do feel free to email me with the uh, email address on the screen now. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Patrick. We do have a number of questions, um, but I'll leave those until the uh, Q&A session at the end. So now it's the turn of our panel members to respond to the report's findings and the recommendations, and also to share their thoughts on how we can improve routine vaccination uptake in people with chronic conditions across Europe. First, um, I'm pleased to announce, uh, or pleased to introduce um, MEP Cyrus Engerer. Uh, Cyrus became a member of the European Parliament in 2020, where he sits as a full member on the Committee for Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, and on the Special Committee Beating Cancer. He's also a substitute member on the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, and on the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy. And he's also the co-chair of the Mental Health Coalition. Cyrus, you're clearly a very busy man. So I thank you very much for sharing your time to be with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you very much for uh, organizing this event and for inviting me to say a few words today. Um, I have listened to Patrick's um, analysis of what came out of the study, which was really interesting um, from my end. And, uh, basically, I wanted to, I mean, I have a speech prepared and I can say all the important stuff on why vaccines are important, why uh, we need to invest more in, uh, in research for vaccinations, why we should give uh, more vaccines to the developing world. However, um, Patrick's um, analysis has actually um, told me to remove all my speech and speak on a number of other issues, especially with regards to uh, Europe, uh, vaccination rates in Europe, not only, uh, obviously currently we're going through the pandemic, which is something which is um, very uh, important to see that we have the vaccines that are uh, being given to everyone all across the member states, but also beyond that through our COVAX um, program. However, um, I wanted to focus on the importance of science, on relying on science and fighting disinformation, because I think that one of the major stumbling blocks that we face as a European Union and globally uh, is the big amount of disinformation that there is out there um, and the lack of trust in science. And I have recently read a, a study by the University of Ghent here in Belgium, where uh, it was seen that when it comes to the COVID pandemic, for instance, there are a number of factors that seem to have affected the number of people that have actually taken the vaccine. And according to the study, trust in health authorities in the members, in the different member states, and that level of trust has resulted in how much, uh, how many people have actually uh, decided to get and take the jab in, in different member states. So for instance, I come from Malta, the smallest European Union member state where our vaccine 
rate for the COVID uh, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, is well above the 90% uh, of our population. It has reached 96% when it comes to the first and second dose. When it comes to the third dose, the booster dose, it is very, very high as well. And we will, I guess, reach the same numbers in the coming weeks uh, and months. And it is a fact also that you see that in my country, there is a big trust in the way that um, people trust the health authorities back home. There is a difference then when you see other member states. So I think that that is one of the most important uh, aspects that we need to uh, really think of when we see what is currently happening in different member states. I agree totally with what Patrick said and the recommendations being made uh, at a European and national level. Um, in my country, for instance, we have uh, free vaccination for chronic diseases or for most chronic diseases uh, as part of our national health system. And I think that that is, uh, it plays a huge role in making sure that people do get vaccinated. And apart from that, yes, I agree with you that we need to have uh, more harmonized um, ways, more harmonized um, uh, narratives and more harmonized laws when it comes to the way that we look at um, vaccinations, the way that we identify which vaccines need to be taken, which vaccines, uh, the timing of these vaccines. So I totally agree with the recommendations currently being made. And I think that when you um, see all in all, it is um, very clear for me that vaccination is one of the key components to ensure a healthy life and can therefore be considered uh, from some aspects as a basic human right. And despite this, as we have seen and as, as we have discussed, a huge part of the world's human population still does not have access to vaccines. And this can risk prevention and control of infectious disease outbreaks. In some countries, progress to achieve accessibility of vaccines that prevent chronic diseases has either been stopped or else reversed. And after all, it is not vaccines that can save lives, but the actual vaccination. So we can develop as many vaccines as we want, but if at the end of the day, people are not getting access to these vaccines and get vaccinated, then it is all done uh, for nothing. So we must ensure that people's, um, when it comes to, uh, to these issues, that when people decide to actually do get vaccines, that they find them accessible, available for them and affordable undoubtedly. Um, I do not want to take too much uh, of your time because I'm sure that the answering discussion will be very interesting uh, also to follow. But in my work within the European Parliament through the various uh, committees that I am working on, I will always be ensuring that human rights are at the forefront of our agenda. And in order to have all human rights at the forefront of our agenda, we must include the right for people to have access to very important vaccinations that can <clears throat> sorry that can save their lives so let us work together to ensure that we show people not only the importance of vaccines and the numerous lives that they can save but also that we as a european union stand behind science that we as a european parliament stand behind science and that we want each and every member state to do more in order to uh, manage and give vaccines to as, as many people as possible in order to combat not only uh, pandemics as we are today or other epidemics, but that we need to combat um, some chronic illnesses too. So thank you very much once again for inviting me to today's discussion. And I look forward to follow the, this discussion and learn even from it. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Cyrus. It's good to, to hear from you, particularly when you say that vaccines are a basic human right. I entirely agree with that. Um, and I do hope you'll be able to stay with us for the Q&A session. Our next speaker is um, Francoise Hoyer. Francois joined the European Organization for Rare Diseases in May 2003, where he is Director for Information and Access to Therapies and uh, health policy advisor. He represents Eurodis on the Patients and Consumers Working Party at the European Medicines Agency. And indeed, he pioneered patient advocacy with the EMA as part of the first patients delegation that engaged in dialogue with the agency. 
We are very pleased to have you with us, Francois. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daphne, and good afternoon uh, to, to all. So rare diseases in one word, in two words, it's 7,000 different conditions. They represent maybe three to 6% of the European population, but it's hard to, to say. And chronic conditions are very heterogeneous, very different from each other. Uh, I would like, like to start saying that at least with COVID-19, the global picture is maybe not that bad as when we have data from some member states, uh, it appeared like, for example, in France, as soon as April of last year, so just four months after the start of the vaccination campaign, up to more than 80% of people with uh, uh, 100 different chronic conditions uh, had received at least one dose. And nowadays we are usually uh, well above 90%, uh, except in some conditions, those who are opioid or alcohol dependent or with mental uh, conditions, which I think is a specific problem. Um, but certainly the key challenges that uh, all member states and patients with chronic diseases and rare diseases encountered, uh, not just with COVID-19 vaccines, but other vaccines as well, is the precise information on benefit risk uh, with different vaccines. Uh, and that's inevitable. Research is first conducted in general population, in healthy people and people with some comorbidities, but when some group analysis are performed, we usually have some information on large groups like diabetes, asthma, arthritis, but then we don't immediately have the information we need for people who are immunocompromised, who receive organ transplant, who have rare neurological diseases or Guillain-Barré syndrome, etc. So they all prefer to wait for more information to be made available to them before they can decide uh, to, to receive the vaccine, whatever the vaccine. But that means that we need special efforts, additional research to provide that information. And also sometimes, uh, and that was mentioned by Patrick before, the information is unclear or can be misleading. And sometimes there are concerns, there are issues which are then solved, but people keep this perception in mind. There was a problem with this vaccine, so I don't take any vaccine because I think that all vaccines can be bad for, for me, even when the issue has been completely solved from a scientific perspective. For example, um, it was once hypothesized that uh, hepatitis B vaccine could expose to an increased risk of, of some neurological disease. And many with neurological diseases uh, applied uh, the consequence that they did not want any vaccine uh, for any rare condition or people with HIV. A life attenuated virus used as a vaccine is a concern, has been or was a concern in immuno uh, deficient people, and, and, and then they assume that all types of vaccines could cause a problem by activating their immune system too much, so there is a kind of caution, maybe uh, over-caution, hyper-caution among certain groups based on past and historical concerns which are now solved, but it takes time before the community, uh, the, the whole community uh, understands the, the medical progress and, and, and the new information. Uh, other uh, challenges can be solved when um, or, uh, communities are very well organized. Uh, two examples, uh, one which is a group of uh, patients who have chronic kidney disease, dialysis, or kidney transplant, uh, and this is an online community of thousands of people, and they organize two-way communication, and they can transmit all questions the patients have, but also all recommendations in real time to the patients, ensuring a very rapid uptake of the information and making sure that no misinformation is shared in, in the community and, and, and which had proven to be extremely effective to respond to all issues people with kidney disease uh, could have had. Uh, another example is the community advocate advisory board uh, created 
especially for COVID-19, which now gathers more than 150 patient advocates from all over the world, uh, all types of conditions. And we work with all stakeholders uh, involved in vaccines for COVID-19. And we transmit all concerns that different patient communities can have. Just a few examples. Some patient uh, communities who could be eligible for gene therapies when the vector is an adenovirus were concerned that the adenovirus used uh, for the COVID-19 vaccines uh, could reduce chances that their future gene therapy could work. So we had to question researchers and developers of COVID-19 vaccines on that risk. Um, other examples are uh, patients who have conditions where they cannot receive any injections, like fibrodysplasia or syphilis progressive. So we need oral and nasal forms of the vaccines, which are now in development. Uh, and the CAB is following and discussing these developments with all actors, industry, CP, COVAX, uh, Vaccelerate, and, and others. Uh, and by knowing that someone is taking care of your issues, of your concerns, and sharing them uh, with the relevant actors, I think has a strong impact on, on patients because they know that in all that noise, uh, someone is listening to them and transmitting their concerns to, to the right uh, actors. And, and maybe to finish this first part by the, the link also with healthcare professionals. In rare diseases, we, we have now a large network of European reference networks of all specialized doctors for most of the rare diseases. And within days, uh, when it was important to decide which patients with chronic conditions and rare diseases were highest priority to receive the COVID-19 vaccines, they produce a list of such conditions of the highest priority and then less priority groups. And this list were used immediately in all member states uh, to, uh, for the recommendations on how to start and how to prioritize uh, citizens who should benefit from the vaccines the first. So this interrelation between patient groups and uh, healthcare professionals uh, listening to their questions the same for people who have some conditions that can predispose to hyperallergic reactions, special care for these people and, and responses from science and doctors on how to vaccinate these people. It's extremely important to organize um, on a large scale. Over to you. Thank you, Francoise, that's great. It, there are a couple of questions I can see that have been raised uh, on um, immuno, the, the immunocompromised patient, um, but I will leave them until the end, um, if you don't mind. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to Mariano Vota. Mariano is um, an EU senior public affairs professional um, and journalist. Um, he, since 2013, he's been the director of the Active Citizenship Network, which is the international branch of an Italian NGO, the name of which I will leave Mariano to tell you. Mariano has 20 years of experience in the field of advocacy, stakeholder engagement, European projects, communication, and civic information. So a good person to comment on this report. Mariano, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daphne. Good afternoon, everybody. Greetings from, from Italy. Um, <clears throat> talking about some uh, challenge to routine vaccination, we can probably start with a precondition. The precondition is to try to overcome the situation lived during the, the first wave of the pandemic and its long, long effect. Uh, we cannot forget that uh, for a while, uh, oncological, but also chronic patients were left almost alone with the risk to jeopardize 20 years of achievement in terms of prevention and care. When uh, vaccination centers were closed or vaccination plans suspended, it was indirectly way sent a wrong message as the routine vaccination uh, could be not, uh, not necessary. This is totally, totally wrong that we have to uh, identify how can we support routine vaccination for uh, the particular target group as the people living with chronic condition. Uh, together with 38 organizations across uh, Europe, we have identified that uh, 
in 60% of the cases, uh, uh, it was uh, denounced by the patients, uh, the lack of therapeutic adherence during the pandemic. This is quite, uh, quite normal according to the situation we have, we have lived. And um, not only, in Italy, we have carried out a survey in which we have uh, monitored 147 vaccination centers in my country. And uh, the 40% of these vaccination centers monitored both opening hours and dedicated staff are reducing, reduced compared to the pre pandemic situation. So, also, the access to vaccination center is still. Uh, uh, open open question. Uh, apart of it, we have to, um, Patrick say the cultural disparities, uh, we can translate also, we can add to cultural disparities, health inequalities. That is key, it is, um, is a fact also in the area of vaccination. For, for COVID-19 vaccination, it was not clear to identify, not in all member states, uh, the list of uh, the people affected by the same chronic chronic disease involved as a priority groups uh, to get vaccine. Uh, again, talking about uh, my, my context in Italy, uh, regional agreements uh, that allowed, uh, for instance, general practitioner and pediatrician uh, to be available to carry out in their clinical setting are in some cases still lacking. So not all are uh, in the condition to provide vaccination in daily repeat clinical setting. And in terms of vaccination recommended for the same target, meningococcal HPV in adolescent population or pneumococcus or zoster in the adult elderly population, free of charge is guaranteed when carried out in recommended age range. While uh, if you go behind, we have to pay. Uh, and another disparity is that in the monitoring of the routine vaccination coverage led by the public authorities only for the flu vaccination, data are collected regularly. So these are some other factors that we have to count to take in consideration. And so we need to, uh, to ask more uniformity to, to reduce disparity, also to reduce uh, uh, because the risk is to reduce trust, trust in, in health institutions. So the last point is, uh, another point is that the, the need to, to switch from uh, therapeutic uh, adherence to probably therapeutic alliance with the general practitioner, with the specialist, uh, that they could play a very relevant, uh, relevant uh, uh, role. Uh, we have interviewed almost 500 uh, uh, among uh, general practitioner and pediatrician, 50% of this pediatrician and 60% of general practitioner in Italy say that it's not easy to convince patients to get vaccination, but probably we need to help them in, in, in order to allow them to better balance the, their activity, their ordinary outpatient activities with the, 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 the routine vaccination activities and to take in consideration to better implement uh, the principle make every contact count. If we allowed them to, uh, uh, to access uh, to the patient's vaccination record, uh, probably they can at each interaction with the chronic patients uh, identify if they are or not uh, vaccinated and so and then to uh, to encourage them to to vaccinate it in a positive way we can uh, identify something that was uh, uh, launched in Italy as a pilot initiative uh, I, I talk about the involvement of the the pharmacies in order to increase uh, uh, the, the the point of access for vaccine for for, for vaccine in general and uh, according to uh, three uh, thousand chronic patients interviewed by my organization, 63 uh, percent of them are in favor to confirm uh, some COVID vaccination services in the pharmacy behind this current pilot uh, 
face and 65% uh, of them agree about the opportunity to extend the involvement of the pharmacies also for routine vaccinations, fluid zoster and pneumococcal vaccination. This could be probably taken into consideration uh, from uh, the, the, the institutions. Also because uh, uh, some of them uh, uh, has, uh, say that uh, have denounced uh, the difficulty to access to routine vaccination during the first wave of the pandemic, 34% of them, while 20% uh, of them also in this current situation. So the, the, the point of the access is still uh, an issue. So what we are doing in this context, in Italy we are working to better identify quality standard for the vaccination center. This is important to reduce inequalities, to provide uh, a tool that could be uh, useful to encourage vaccine, uh, vaccine uh, uptake and to reduce uh, um, vaccination, vaccine hesitancy. We are drafting the quality charter of the vaccination center in, uh, in my country. And this is one of the also concrete example I read the, in the chat, what can we do? We can probably start to collect data such citizens and patient advocacy group. This is important to open the dialogue with the institutions, with the relevant stakeholder. For instance, again, at the national level, what about the connection between, for instance, the chronicity plan that exists in my country with the, the, the uh, vaccination plan? What is the connection? Can we collect some data? What is the, the interaction? but also with the antimicrobial resistance plan that is now we stay in, in a, a advisory group uh, in order to uh, send also in this context some uh, recommendations to the public institution in my country and we are also to define the better way to uh, to play a role starting from the collection of data not statistical because we are we, we play another kind of role but the daily life uh, data come the data come from the daily life of, of, of the citizens this is important because this allowed us to open uh, uh, the dialogue with the not just with the institution but also the, the stakeholder let me say that uh, uh, an information that we have received one week ago by the european commission so at the european level it was uh, identify some uh, we can say good news by the online platform in terms to fight the disinformation vaccination in general. So for instance, Facebook has removed some anti-vax groups, Twitter has identified some way to better identify fake news. Google uh, host information about useful information about pediatric vaccination. This could be probably the first step in which also the, the big players can, can play a role in the context of corporate social responsibility, but is uh, again lacking the role and uh, the, the chance to talk about the routine vaccination for specific and uh, target group like the, uh, the people living with uh, chronic condition. And so it, it urgent some tailored initiative. Last point. What about um, the citizens and patient advocacy group involvement in the context of the development of the national uh, immunization plan across, uh, across the country? If this topic is one of the priority among the national recovery plans in my country and in each member state, because probably we have lost a great opportunity to put much uh, resources uh, in prevention in general and immunization in, in particular, and this is uh, uh, probably a, a lost occasion, we can say. So there are a lot of uh, issues about, about it. And uh, the, unfortunately, the level of engagement of the civil society is still lacking at the national level uh, in my context, but probably also at European level. I remember two years before the pandemic in 2018, when the European Commission launched 20 initiatives to increase the, the vaccine coverage across Europe to fight uh, the, the vaccine hesitancy, it was put in place uh, the, the Coalition for Vaccination, nice initiative, but I want to remember that it was at the origin just uh, 
identify for uh, open ed just for the healthcare professional and the student for medicine. Thanks to our commitment, we have encouraged the European Commission to open the door also to the citizens and patient focus group. That is crucial. They are our commitment to uh, in, in the topic, the policy on vaccination. Thanks. Mariama, thank you very much indeed. Um, this is just a note that I've had to come through. Um, we need more questions in the question and answer box, please. So everybody listening, um, the, the Q&A box is there for you to post your questions. Um, I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, who is Sibelia Kasi, uh, Kilisi, sorry, Sibelia, um, Executive Director of Vaccines Europe, which represents innovative research-based vaccine companies operating in Europe. Sibelia has a track record in studies evaluating the full benefits of preventative message. <laughs> oh my goodness, preventive measures, including vaccination, from a socio medico economic perspective, addressing all the relevant stakeholders which concern us today that's government, industry, society, healthcare professionals, and citizens. Now, Sibelia holds an international MBA in entrepreneurship and an MSc in health economics and biostatistics, so can offer us a slightly different angle. Please, Sibelia. Thank you, Daphne, and, uh, and thank you, everyone, and uh, for, for this event and also for, 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 for me to be part of this panel on this important topic. Um, I had a few questions to go through, so maybe... Uh, the first one I was asked was, uh, what are the key challenges for routine immunization vaccination for those with chronic conditions across Europe? So for me, the, the first challenge, uh, and I think this will uh, meet with uh, what Francois said, uh, as well as Mariano, um, the, the key challenge is for every stakeholder, and I may say something trivial, but to understand the meaning of the importance of life course vaccination, the life course approach to vaccination, so that routine immunization can be prioritized as an essential services across the life course and therefore offer to the relevant individual at the relevant point in his lifetime. And indeed, vaccination is not only about kids anymore, although it is an essential part of it. Vaccination is not only about a collective responsibility as we heard it so much during the pandemic. Vaccination is also about who you are as an individual. And we are all different depending on our health status, depending on your age, on your lifestyle and occupation. And indeed, uh, wherever you are a healthy person or a person with an underlying conditions, you are not at all at the same risk of an infection, neither it's complication. So taking into consideration the specificities of the individual is critical. And there is a good and scientific rationale for chronic patients to be protected against infection, whether they are eligible to, vac to vaccination or they may not be uh, eligible to vaccination, but they need to know that. And today we have actually the tools uh, to provide those personalized recommendations. So that would be for me the second challenge, which is related to information. But beyond information is how we can actually give a personalized recommendation from healthcare providers to the patient. And this requires adequate training uh, for all healthcare providers, including the specialists that are taking care of the patients. Um, it also uh, requires adequate access to the information for the patient. And why not a, a decision ed tool to provide those personalized recommendation, whether we depend on, so we, we rely on artificial intelligence, digital, but there is actually this opportunity to personalize the recommendation based on what we know today. This actually already exists. We have a, a, such a tool in France, um, but surely it can be uh, optimized and, and, and made uh, at the pan-European level. That tool, to give an example, because I had to do, do a search recently, um, if you are a patient with a kidney failure uh, and look for uh, what is needed for you, the tool will say, well, you are much more at risk of a pneumococcal infection, four times more than a normal patient person. So this is why vaccination is important for you. So just to give an idea of what's feasible, I think is, is important. 
Um, another, for me, challenge is related to funding, uh, to access in general, but uh, access is also related to funding. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's coming from the report and it was also uh, mentioned by Patrick, um, 30% of EU countries requires that people with chronic conditions have to pay part of all of it for, for some of the vaccines such as flu. Uh, and this is coming out of pocket. I think it's really important, and it was also uh, said by Patrick, that 80% of the EU countries spend less than 0.5% of their healthcare budget on immunization. This means that over the past years, it accounts for just five euros per capita or less on immunization. I think there is need for immunization financing for uh, uh, definitely um, uh, ensuring sustainable funding for the immunization program. Re still related to access, uh, it's related to uh, expanding the delivery services, ensuring your convenience access, depending on who you are, you need to, to have an easy access uh, to vaccination, uh, whether it is given to nurses, doctors, pharmacists, or your specialist, we should not have fight within the healthcare system of who, who should deliver vaccination. It should just be easy for the patients to access it. So for me, those really the, the, the challenges that, uh, that we, can, uh, we can consider. Uh, in terms of lessons learned, COVID-19, um, uh, uh, the second question was, what are the lessons learned from COVID-19 uh, pandemics that can improve seasonal vaccination campaigns in the future? I think the lessons learned for me, and it was mentioned by Mariano, is that there is a lack of resiliency of our health system, and especially in our immunization system. The pandemic actually created a disruption uh, in the access to vaccination programs. Some member states actually uh, reduced or completely stopped uh, the implementation of their program. And there has been joint call from WHO and UNICEF to ensure that member states will resume their immunization programs across the life course. So not only pediatrics, which was a massive uh, major public health issue, but really across this life course. And today is really complicated uh, to, to recover the, the delay in vaccination coverage rates uh, because most of the resources are dedicated to COVID-19 vaccination, and there is not enough healthcare providers, neither the infrastructure is just not there to ensure the routine immunization. Um, and, and other lessons learned, so all of that, in fact, the lack of resiliency is, is just echoing what I mentioned with regards to the lack of investment in the immunization programs, which re, um, also translate into uh, a lack of infrastructure in place to ensure uh, there is no disruption, lack of training programs for the healthcare providers, lack of communication or relevant communication to the citizens, etc. So investment is, is, is uh, really, really critical. And, and also the sense is, and it was also mentioned by, by Mariano, is the value of data. What we've seen during COVID-19 has never been seen before is the value of timely monitoring of the disease infection, but as well as the coverage rate. And, and, and this is critical in order to, to have timely decision-making as well uh, being done for the sake of population. So value of data, uh, the, the, obviously, the, the relevant and the value of ECDC in that regard is critical, and the role of member states in delivering those data to the ECDC is massively important. Importance of convenience in access, I already uh, mentioned that. The importance of qualitative and coordinated communication as well to drive vaccines confidence, this is uh, critical. And uh, also from the, the pandemic, what we've seen is the importance of political leadership. And with regards to immunization program, you need strong political leadership. We, we see that this is really uh, impacting uh, the, uh, the implementation and the uptake among the population, uh, and this is critical. So if, if we look at what can be done more, uh, one of the questions as well that I was given is, what must be done at an EU level to ensure better uptake of routine immunization in Europeans with chronic conditions? And in fact, I was reflecting on these questions and it was also mentioned by Mariano with uh, this uh, more than 20 initiative at, at the EU level with regards to vaccination. A lot has been done at EU level, in fact. Uh, more than anything else, we need to sustain what has been done, what is currently being done, the engagement, and how this is going to translate at member state level. I think this is really important. So for instance, we have the, 
European Coalition on Vaccination with a brilliant project, Immunion, uh, that is targeting vaccine confidence uptake, but also the training of healthcare professionals. This needs to be sustained over the next years. Uh, this is really important. The joint action on vaccination, which actually um, was a, a three-year program strengthening the coordination between member states, is meant to end this year. Uh, where, where, whereas they actually monitor the uh, uh, aim at monitoring apparently the vaccination coverage rate, ensuring access across the European Union for every citizen, uh, forecasting uh, the demand as well as vaccines confidence, etc. Uh, we've seen with COVID-19 that the coordination between member states is critical and we are still not there yet. So finding a way to actually sustain the joint action on vaccination and to continue uh, yeah, with, uh, with the legacy that is creating uh, would be really important. And today we have also the EU for Health uh, initiative that uh, the EU put in place to address healthcare system resilience as a response to the pandemic. And the work program uh, for 2022 has just been released about uh, two weeks, three weeks ago. And in this work program, you have 30 million euros specifically dedicated to support the large scale of vaccination including best practice sharing between member states on uptake, optimizing current routine vaccination practices and catch-up vaccination. And here is uh, really the EU giving the member states, the health organizations, the NGOs, funds to improve routine immunization accordingly to the specificities of their population. So a lot uh, is actually at disposal from the EU level uh, with EU funds on the table. Again, how we make sure that this is sustained and what has been initiated uh, also translate into uh, actions at member state level. I think this is really critical. And last but not the least, I think it's really the role of ECDC and how Europe can support better ECDC in receiving the data from the member states for this timely monitoring of coverage rate. And priority should really be given to those infections disease because what has been done for COVID-19 obviously would be really difficult to be done for all the infectious diseases for which we have vaccination. And here we are actually uh, looking at more than 20 infectious diseases. So if we ask tomorrow the CDC to have timely monitoring for all of them, it would be a bit complicated from a, a, a resource standpoint, but having a priority with regards to um, the, the most at risk diseases, as well as for the, the most at risk population, uh, I think would be uh, really critical. And uh, the support of EU in ensuring that ECDC can do that uh, with the support of member states uh, would, be, uh, would be critical. I pause here and happy to answer to any questions. Very many thanks, Sibelia. And thank you also for describing so succinctly what life course immunization is. I hope people um, understand and take that on board. Um, our final speaker is Susanna Palkinen. Uh, Susanna is director of the European Federation of Allergy and Airways Diseases Patients Association. Uh, this organization brings together 44 members, 44 member associations from 25 countries, and it represents over 200 million people with allergies, asthma, and COPD in Europe. Since 2019, Susanna has been chair of the Patient Access Partnership, which is a multi-stakeholder initiative to improve equal access to patient-centered care in Europe. And she also sits on the Global Initiative for Asthma Implementation and Dissemination Committee. Susanna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Daphne. Um, I'm not going to repeat many of the things that uh, colleagues already mentioned, um, except that, uh, yes, uh, access and uh, targeted information for the people that we are uh, representing, people with allergy, asthma, and COPD, is, uh, these are critical uh, factors to improve their uh, vaccination, vaccination uptake. Uh, I would like to bring you back into 2019. Uh, that is when IFA um, uh, surveyed uh, people with asthma and COPD in uh, nine European countries. We were asking them also about uh, access to prevention. And what we found out is that um, 
the good news is that uh, people with asthma and COPD in Europe, they are aware of the risk factors for their disease, uh, risk factors like, uh, like smoking, air pollution, uh, but also uh, things like respiratory infections. But what actually was uh, worrisome that we found out is that um, asthma and COPD patients uh, perceive uh, action plans and access to flu and pneumococcus vaccination as least beneficial in improving their health situation compared to other, other preventative factors that we were asking about. But of course, this may have changed now with uh, everything that happened have, has happened with the COVID-19. Uh, but uh, my point is that, um, in fact, um, like it's the spirit of the report that is being launched uh, today, in fact, for people with chronic condi conditions, vaccination should be not something separate. It's not uh, enough that it's a public health uh, measure. It must be part of their regular healthcare plan to um, so that they know, okay, this is my self-management plan. And during this time of the year, I'm going to have my vaccination and it's, it's my care. It's my preventative care that I'm having every, every year when the, when the time comes, uh, time comes uh, as I'm having my regular, regular treatment uh, every day. So that is very, very uh, important, and there should be no barriers uh, to access it in that way. And it is, it is discussed with my healthcare professional, and uh, is is nothing uh, nothing separate. So anything that can be uh, done to improve that situation would be uh, would be very much uh, welcome. Um, in fact, uh, what we um, the report found that there is a really, really uh, urgent need uh, to um, have more data on the uptake of the of the vaccination among among people with chronic conditions. We totally agree. Uh, but what is needed to complement that uh, is uh, data to understand what are the barriers. Um, for people with uh, chronic condition, conditions as reported by them to access uh, vaccinations. So that kind of data could very well complement the kind of actions that uh, um, or inform actions that we need to take to improve uh, the situation. If we don't ask the patients themselves, then we will never find the, the golden bullet to to address uh, the kind of barriers that they experience. And there is very important to understand that how is misinformation and uh, different kind of uh, sources of information influencing how um, people with, um, for example, respiratory diseases make their decisions about having a uh, vaccination. Um, there have been some great things happening during the COVID-19 by bringing uh, the science and approval process of uh, medicines, and in this case, in this case uh, of vaccines, to the people. Uh, we have a population in Europe now that uh, everybody is somehow aware that something like this is happening somewhere, and people are looking into the development and uh, approval of, um, of, um, of vaccines. And I think that is something that uh, should not be lost uh, at all, because um, in the long run, that is the best way of, um, of fighting any kind of misinformation, that uh, concise, uh, clear, information on, on, on medicines and uh, vaccines and transparent come, um, come regularly um, accessible to, to everybody. Um, and I'm wondering how 
Will we fall into that, uh, how it was that there are certain uh, things reported in the press uh, when something interesting is happening or some scandal or some uh, side effect? Or can we, can we open a new era of health information in, uh, in Europe? Um, there is something to be understood about patient groups also, because uh, we have uh, very many urging things to do about access to care. So traditionally, uh, things like vaccination among our high risk groups has not been the first priority that we are working on. But I really very much uh, like the recommendation in the report that actually the public authorities should proactively seek to work with patient charities and, uh, and citizens groups on, on the vaccination programs and uh, vaccination information. I like that recommendation because it doesn't put the whole responsibility on us with very little resources, but it puts it uh, to others to come to us and to, and to work with us. Uh, respiratory disease patients, um, they are, uh, as far as I, I saw in the report, 100% of the, of the European countries that you were looking at uh, are recommending um, vaccination to respiratory patients. But uh, the uptake, as far as you found information, was um, less than 50% uh, of them. So there is something that we need to uh, grasp, grasp here um, to improve the situation, especially um, when, uh, when we know that, um, for example, respiratory infection, uh, it can be a very horrible situation um, in uh, asthma or COPD patients' life. And uh, for people with uh, COPD, it can cause uh, permanent, um, permanent damage in their, uh, in their condition. So uh, it's serious and it needs to be taken uh, seriously. Uh, so if I was also representing uh, people with allergy, so there are always coming up specific issues in this population and also in the general, uh, general population about allergic reactions and especially life-threatening uh, reactions to the, to the vaccines. Um, the public authorities are doing quite a uh, quite good job in always having this information as part of the part of the first information coming about um, and, and part of the approval process for uh, for vaccines. But there is one thing that is never considered. For example, now uh, we have several uh, vaccines uh, for the COVID-19, but and then people with the with the risk of uh, severe allergic reactions in, the, in general, then they would be looking at, okay, so which one of these vaccines might be most the one that I should, I should get, um, that I would be least at, uh, at risk. So my point is that it's very important uh, indeed to have uh, targeted information and precise information and not just repeating the same vaccines about these issues. Um, nothing is more har harmful for a vaccine that there is some kind of rumor going out about, uh, about um, fatal allergic uh, reactions. But, so that uh, really... Um, requires uh, specific attention and the allergy patient groups are there to work with authorities to, to combat any, any misinformation. I said a few things uh, on, in addition to, to what others already, already said. Um, I would also like to say that um, my organization is a member of the European Patients Forum. Uh, who has done a great job in uh, filling some of the gaps uh, of targeted information to chronic disease patients. And 
by the word of uh, I think it was Isabella in the in the roundtable that we had earlier, building up to this re report that. Uh, if that um, targeted information is not used and is sitting on the shelves, um, then it's of no use. So let's use it. Let's spread it and uh, give the chronic disease patients uh, the information that they need. Thank you very much. And now looking forward to any questions. Thank you very much, Susanna. Uh, we've heard from, now, from all of our speakers now. So uh, I'm going to open the floor to questions from the audience. And we do have some questions, but let me remind you, remind you to post more. And actually, I'm going to direct the first um, question um, directly back to Susanna, um, because we've had a question here that says, how can targeted vaccination information be more accessible when there are limitations on, for example, on social media campaigns to target people with chronic conditions? Excellent question. Also, my organization have had problems in uh, health messages that have been uh, censored by some of these uh, social media platforms. That's a uh, that's very important question. So when we think uh, it's done in uh, different countries in a different way, uh, how to have um, evidence-based um, information for a person with a specific condition especially when they are diagnosed or the kind of patient information that they need to manage their chronic disease um, every day, which we call, for example, a self-management plan or action plan. So what I'm referring to is that, uh, that it should be part of that kind of uh, information. I'm not saying that it should be something separate or something specifically promoted in social media. There are management information for patients, uh, patient education materials on uh, managing your chronic, chronic disease. So it must be really there and integrated into the healthcare. If you have an idea how to, <laughs> how to avoid any kind of censorship uh, on social media on um, giving evidence-based information related to that. Let me know. <laughs> we certainly will. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, and the lady who, who, uh, who asked the question, um, Kate Pierpoint, uh, I know has been working on something quite similar to this. So um, we may get back to you on that. Um, we got another couple of questions here. Um, that are um, with regard to, to um, one is mandatory vaccination. Should mandatory vaccination be introduced to healthcare professionals coming into contact with people with chronic conditions? And something uh, slightly similar, when edu educating and persuading provides provi proves to be inefficient, is it appropriate and effective to, to use more coercive measures i.e. restriction, withdrawal, et cetera, to increase vaccination rates. Who would like to um, tackle that? Um, anyone? Um, Francois, perhaps? Give it a try. Um, I think it depends on the context. Here with COVID, we are in a crisis situation. It's difficult to enforce mandatory measures uh, as it adds to the global anxiety, if you will, uh, for more uh, chronic or uh, calm uses of vaccines, I think we, we can take the time to discuss, to consult whether to ensure to enforce mandatory vaccination. Uh, it takes time. In France, I know that at school, we have 11 mandatory vaccines. Uh, some are opposed to that, saying that it's uh, vaccination more important than education. So there is a political debate, but no, no, no conflict. Uh, but when it's a crisis situation like now, it's more difficult, but there are measures that strongly encourage people to get vaccinated, one of which probably the most effective that I could hear last year was right before the summer break. If you don't get vaccinated immediately, uh, that could ruin your holidays and this provoked a rush to all vaccination centers. And I think health authorities and governments 
globally was, were smart in sharing together different measures that worked by monitoring uh, daily or weekly the number of people going to the vaccination centers. They could test different measures. And I think now we have quite a large understanding of measures that prove to work without enforcing mandatory measures. Thanks very much. Yes, certainly here in France, the use of the pass sanitaire and the, and the um, vaccination passport now has been very useful, in, 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 or at least um, in increasing the, the uptake of vaccination. If, if I may add to this, uh, yes, please. February 21, uh, all in all in Europe, we are 10 points above uh, the proportion of people who say they were likely to get a vaccine. So altogether, the, the results achieved are much higher uh, than what we could have assumed back in February 2021 with all the measures uh, that have been proposed in, 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 since then. Thank you. Uh, right, now I have another one here. Um, Mariano said, um, and it's a phrase which I picked up on is make every contact count. And we have another uh, question here that said the importance of making every contact count in identifying and encouraging take up a vaccination in those with chronic conditions. And the question is, who are the key people to do that? Um, Mariano, do you want to try that one? Yes. I, we can consider the ones that are closer to the people living with chronic uh, condition. So not only the, the general practitioner, but also the specialist, if they are, uh, um, they can access uh, to the health record of each one of the patients, which is included information on vaccination, they could be the first one able to encourage or also to answer the, the question about the apps, et cetera, for people that have to be um, vaccinated. Um, apart of it, I think that we, are, we can also take in consideration the role of the informal, uh, uh, the role of the caregivers. They play a role when we talk about uh, chronic patients. And the, their role is often underestimated in terms of, uh, um, we can say, job uh, uh, re recognized, uh, but also their, their empowerment. And we can probably invest much more in terms of uh, their, uh, their, the, the role they play, the role they play. A part of it, I have, uh, I don't know if it's possible, Daphne, but it's probably important also for us, uh, taking uh, the, the, the opportunity that we have a uh, member of the Parliament to identify from the European institutions the commitment of the institutions in terms of prevention, in terms of immunization, in the context of the Conference of the Future of Europe, as all of us think the, the model of the, the Europe we, we would like to, to, uh, to stay and to live. Uh, because one of the paradox is that even we live, uh, in, we stay in the pandemic, the topic of health in the context of the Conference of the Future of Europe is not very developed. And uh, if we stay together now talking about uh, some recommendation in terms of uh, routine vaccination uh, and, uh, and the people affected with chronic condition, what should be the commitment of the institutions at this point? This, I think that this could be very relevant for the ones who work to advocate. Thanks, um, well, Mariana. An answer, but also a question. <laughs> I don't think we've got uh, Cyrus um, still on the line to, to respond to that. Have we? No, I, I, I don't think he's here. Um, you're dead right, though. I mean, I, I quite agree that, that um, we need political will and we need to start to talk to the politicians seriously. And I, I know your organisation already does this, um, but I think we need uh, quite a lot um, more with that. And something here that, that um, has just come up um, that, that kind of 
uh, goes into that, as it were. It says, how can civil society organisations for whom vaccines are not a top priority be engaged in vaccine advocacy? Now, perhaps my um, response to that would be, well, start to talk to people um, who are influential. Um, is there anyone who'd like to, to elaborate on that one? Yeah, Mariano again? Yes, but probably <clears throat> what I already say that uh, is crucial according to me to start to collect data from a citizen's perspective. This is crucial because uh, thanks to the data, we can provide a picture of the state of the heart uh, from the daily, daily life of a uh, lot, uh, lot of us. And we can encourage also some recommendations that are uh, linked with some data that we can, we can collect. And this is important because uh, in, in the field on, on vaccination, we do not find, to be honest, a uh, so much number of patient advocacy groups and citizens organizations involved on the topic. This is crucial to enrich the number of the association to be more active. And the way to be active is probably to sensitize their constituency about uh, the value of the, uh, of the vaccination, to collect the data, to promote initiative. And we don't have, uh, our standing point is not focused just on one vaccination, but is focused on the value of vaccination. And so our message is to support the vaccination policy as a, as a world. This is important. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we have, do have quite a lot of questions here, actually. Um, I was just going through them to see um, what uh, would be the next one that... Uh... Uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, uh, this, this may be best to go to Sibelia. Um, outside of uh, emergence... Uh, the, the question is uh, actually concerns about the use of, of more of one vac uh, of use of one vaccine at a time or more than one vaccine at, at a time. Um, does uh, does the principle still apply that, that um, you use one vaccine at a time to establish um, side effects? Uh, Sibelia, have you got any comments on that? I think I need to understand better the question, um, Daphne. But uh, so let me read it. Let me read it out to you as it was written. I was taught that outside of emergency situations, it was best practice to use one vaccine at a time so that the source of any side effects could, could be established. Does this principle still apply? Well, in fact, uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, vaccines are uh, assessed in a way uh, which they can be used in combination with others sometimes. For example, pneumococcal vaccination and influenza vaccination has been assessed from an efficacy and safety standpoint to be used in combination if necessary because it's uh, seasonal, it's the same season that is at stake. Uh, and with regards to what happened with COVID-19, for example, and indeed the, the uh, combination of uh, influenza and COVID-19 or the, the possibility to vaccinate uh, at the same time for influenza and COVID-19 has been assessed uh, based on, on knowledge that we have on influenza. The influenza vaccines is one of the, of the vaccines that is uh, being combined with all the other vaccines most frequently. So the, 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 the use in combination is known to be safe. Uh, and, and this is uh, where the recommendation uh, came from. So, so no, the, the combination is, is normally completely assessed in the same way as for individual vaccines, where the safety or, or monitored, the efficacy and safety are monitored uh, in, in trials that were designed for it as well. Lovely, thank you very much. I think we've got time for just one more question before I, I, I sum up. Um, It's the, uh, okay. The possibility of annual COVID nineteen vaccine for vulnerable groups may facilitate uptake of one of other vaccines for flu, etc. Et 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 do uh, does the panel think that's true? That um, if we do have an annual COVID nineteen vaccination um, for vulnerable groups, indeed for all of us. Um, would this facilitate uptake of other vaccines? Um, it certainly does seem to have done for flu. And I can see Patrick 
rising to stand <laughs> yeah. there. Okay, down to you for the last. Yeah, one. I thought I'd, I thought I'd just come in on that. So, like um, last September, IRC published uh, another report reducing the risk, where we looked at the same sort of topic, but focusing in on on people with conditions in the UK. Um, and certainly, when you look at the data um, across the four home nations of the UK, uh, vaccine uptake for flu has gone up. Um, beyond 2020, um, when you look at it compared to, say, the 2018-19 flu season, um, the 2020-21 season was higher. So I think there is certainly an awareness, um, but whether or not it wanes and it kind of falls back again is, is the real concern. I think certainly it is fresh in people's minds at the moment. What is a vaccine and how do you get them and why they're important? Whether or not that's only in people's minds for COVID-19 is another matter. Um, so I think certainly I think people with chronic conditions are aware um, and vaccination has gone up slightly. But even recently, when you look at the data up until the start of the year, vaccination for flu in chronic condition groups in the UK, I think it was 49 percent, whereas the booster vaccine was around 65, 66 percent for that group. Um, so in the first three months from September to December, it's clearly COVID is in the forefront of people's minds and flu isn't, but it is better than it was, I think. So fingers crossed things stay like that in the future. Thank you very much. And I think it's time now to, to just sum up. Um, thank you all very much. We've had, well, let me, let me just say, is there anything else anyone would like to say? Any panellists thinks that there's something that we should have covered we haven't um, or anything that they would like to round up with? No? Okay. Well, um, thank you all very much. We've had a very interesting dialogue. There's no doubt about that. We've had some questions there. Um, and I don't know whether those questions can be saved um, that, that, that people have sent into us so that we can address them perhaps somewhere um, at a later date. Um, but we've got some major take home points. We've got the four key barriers that are associate, associated with low uptake uh, it, with people with chronic conditions, but I think in all, all peoples uh, who um, are receivers of vaccines. We have communications issues. We have a lack of coherence, um, as Patrick has said, cultural factors, gaps in preventative health expenditure, lack of data. Uh, that has all been um, reiterated by our panelists. We've got structural barriers, accessibility issues, um, pharmacies uh, need to be able to, to give vaccinations. Pharmacists need to be able to give vaccinations all the time. And that, that is, is, is uh, from my point of view, absolutely crucial. Um, we have the cost of vaccines and actually where we live, towns, cities, the countryside, it's all different. Um, and personal reluctance, uh, complacency, concerns, concerns about efficacy and the mistrust of authority. So we've got to address that. And how are we going to do this? It says in the report, um, we need to improve information. That's come across very clearly. We need to, local engagement to encourage uptake and the barriers to access must be removed. As I've said, we need to engage with pharmacists um, and uh, community healthcare professionals in general. So I'd like to thank all our speakers and everybody who joined us on the webinar today. I think we've had um, 34 or 35 participants, which is good. Um, I've got just one final thing um, to remind you about the ILC's next event. Um, it will be hosted on Tuesday, the 15th of February, and they'll be hosting the Work for Tomorrow Innovation Pitching Sessions. Um, over the past year, ILC has been running the Work for Tomorrow program, which is an in international innovation competition to identify the most promising solutions responding to an aging workforce. Sounds great. Um, and hopeful contestants from several countries will be pitching their solutions before ILC's international judging panel. Um, Sounds a bit like um, a television programme we see <laughs> um, around here. Um, so please visit the events tab on the ILC website for more details. Thank you so much, everyone, and goodbye.